Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus, and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the BlackBrazilToday.com blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So today I want to discuss a topic that uh, I don't think it gets a lot of press outside of Brazil. And to be honest, I don't think it's a, you know, it's not like a hot topic among the general population in Brazil today. But uh, I'll say among those in the know, uh, we'll say people who have been studying this situation, uh, scholars, professors, you know, government governmental representatives this is a discussion i just don't think it's reached the broader population even though you know this is something that has been a hotly debated topic in the united states for a number of years i think eventually this will become a, a more commonly discussed topic among the you know just average brazilians but for right now it seems to be you know just a certain group of people that have this topic as you know as the center of a debate historical justice recognition and reparation at UNESCO, Brazilian government speaks of commitment to reparation policies for blacks. OK, so the topic for today is reparations. Um, as I've said, I, I think a lot of Americans of, you know, whatever background are familiar with the discussion in the United States. But it's, it's slowly emerging as a topic of discussion in Brazil. And why not? I've said over and over through the blog and now the video channel, the YouTube channel, uh, Brazil imported the most Africans into the country during the period of slavery than all the other countries, you know, the, it, even though Amer Americans may be, you know, uh, aware of slavery in the United States, but I'm saying you talk about slavery in Dominican Republic or Haiti or Venezuela, Colombia, you know, Brazil, Jamaica, you know, all of these places had, you know, North America, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, you had slavery in all of these countries, right? It's just, you know, I don't think it's as much discussed as what happens in the United States, but it should be. You know, uh, I've said many times that Brazil, it can be said that Brazil imported anywhere from 10 to 15 times more Africans than what happened in the United States. Now, these numbers, I'm going to show a couple of graphs as I go on. If you just break it down according to the colonizing country, whether it was Great Britain, the Portuguese, Spanish people, you know, uh, Spain, then the numbers get a little bit more even. But that's because the British colonized various countries throughout the Americas, whereas Brazil, uh, the Portuguese colonized one big country, which is Brazil. So but I'm going I'm to explain that as I go on. But for now, please just like this video, share this video. Uh, consider subscribing to the channel, clicking on that notification bell. So let me get directly into the topic at hand for today. The representative of the general coordination of memory and truth of slavery and transatlantic trafficking of enslaved persons, Fernanda Tomas, during her speech at UNESCO. So this is Fernanda Tomas. You know, she did a video that I'm going to just I'm going to feature a little bit of her videos. I'm talking about this. So, again, the discussion for today is a reparations. OK. Um, needless to say, Brazil being the recipient of the most Africans, enslaved Africans brought to the new world. You know, Brazil should have a major stake in this discussion. You know, it should be something that is discussed because the point is years after you know, the ending, the the uh, the uh, abolition of slavery in 1888, Brazil being the last country to abolish slavery in the Americas, these longstanding um, inequalities still exist in Brazil today. So I'm saying, saying Brazil, largest recipient, the last country to abolish slavery in the Americas in 1888. So Brazil started slavery be before the nation that will become the United States. And in, in, it continued slavery after slavery was abolished in the United States. Um, to this day, we still see just vast inequalities between the white and the non-white population in Brazil. It's, it's enormous. Um, so when we talk about vast social racial inequalities that still exist today, let's just just take a look at a few of the numbers here. OK, so here. Um, let's see. Black and white people in Brazil experience inequality in many areas, including education, salary and health. And it goes on and on. These are just a few of the numbers. Black people in Brazil have lower educational attainment than white people. In 2012, less than 13 percent of black people over the age of 16 had a like a college education 
or, you know, education beyond high school compared to almost 28 percent of Brazilians who consider themselves white. Black people in Brazil earn less than white people in 2021. The average monthly income for white people was 75.7 percent higher than for black people. Even among people with a university degree, white people earned around 50 percent more than black people. Now, just to be fair, I've said this before. You can't necessarily just look at these stats without comparing apples to apples. I mean, if you have a person who has a college degree in engineering versus somebody who has something in, say, well, I don't know, you know, some social, you know, some social science area, there's, there's going to be a difference in salary there. The, the only way you can see if the vast inequalities you have is if you take uh, an, you know, a, a person of African descent who has who works in engineering versus a, a white person who works in engineering, how many years they've worked in that particular area to come to a conclusion about if there's any, you know, type of inequality. I have to recognize that. Um, in terms of health, black people in Brazil have worse health outcomes than white people. Uh, we saw that in COVID-19 mortality rates for black people being a third higher than for white Brazilians. Other factors that contribute to inequality in Brazil include poverty rates for black people are twice as that, twice that of white people. Black people are under underrepresented, underrepresented in managerial positions have to point out that they're vastly underrepresented in Brazil's government um, and in an un, unequal labor system. Brazil has an unfair tax system. So these are some of the reasons why still today in 2023, Brazil has an enduring racial gap. New economic analysis reveals that despite some progress, Brazil must do more to address racial inequality. Now, one thing that I, I do want to point out, and this has been something that people have talked about for years since the implementation of uh, affirmative action policies in Brazil, it has given more non-white Brazilians access to higher education. And, you know, black and brown people are starting to ascend socially in ways that just wasn't possible 30 and 40 years ago. This article here is calling it how affirmative actions, Brazil's version of affirmative actions are a silent revolution because you're seeing more black and brown people rising into positions in Brazil. You just didn't see them, you know, in these positions years ago. Um, Brazil has its own commission on slavery repara reparations. I've talked about this for a number of years. These are just a few of the articles. This one from 2018, the Brazilian state is mainly responsible for the crimes committed against blacks in the country. National Commission on Truth of on Black Slavery to issue report in December on reparations findings. Okay. Let me just take a look and see what this looks like. This is a popular lawyer, Umberto Adami. He's one of the people on this commission looking for truth and being able to come to a conclusion about, well, how do we, you know, how do we repair, you know, historical inequalities that have existed in Brazil for, you know, hundreds of years now? Um, in the beginning, this lawyer wasn't necessarily speaking about having financial compensation. He said, we are opting not to talk about financial repair in this first moment for now, because in the attempts that we have already, in the attempts that have already occurred, let me see which decided to calculate a sum of money. The discussions were interrupted. So at that point, he was saying that, well, this is not really the point. It's really to address the issue right now and just to put it on the table. Historic reparations for people who have been broken in some type of way because of the connection to slavery. Um, but then they did come up with a number. There was a number that came up that says it, slavery reparations could be worth what the U.S. eight quadrillion U.S. dollars. That's 15 zeros for those of you not familiar with quadrillion. Quadrillion. That's 15, 15 zeros there. Okay. Uh, to be talking about who who's going to qualify for these, you know, uh, you know, financial reparations. This is Jose Vicente. I think it would it, it would even be kind of an issue in Brazil as to who would qualify for reparations in Brazil because so many people are descendants of slavery, even if they look white on the outside because of this ongoing race mixture that goes on in Brazil, you can have people who have this, they are descendants of slavery, you know, going back to, you know, before 1888, they just happen to look white now. So my question would be with those people, should they be, you know, qualified as being able to be uh, a recipient of, of any type of financial reparations? That's a discussion. I don't even want to talk about it today. In the United States, we have a discussion that's going on where people are talking about, well, only people who are American descendants of slaves should be should have reparations in the United States. You know, if your family was not in the United States before the abolition of slavery, maybe you shouldn't qualify for reparations if that ever happened. That's something that I happen to support, because what I'm saying is 
slavery has existed throughout the Americas. If you have people coming into the United States from whether they be Haiti, Haitians, whether they be Brazilians, Colombians, you know, Puerto Ricans, whoever they might be. Um, for me, as you have slavery throughout all of those countries, those countries, people who are descendants from those or, you know, uh, citizens from those countries, they should address uh, their reparations demands at the country of their or their origin. If you're a recent immigrant to the United States, why should a person who's a recent immigrant qualify for slavery reparations that come out of the American government? If you're Puerto Rican or Dominican or Haitian or Brazilian, or Venezuelan, whatever you are, Colombian, you should be bringing those, bringing that discussion to your country of origin. And understand, there are reparations commissions in numerous countries throughout the Americas. I'm just talking about Brazil today. This is Jose Pisenci. He is the dean of Brazil's only black college, uh, Unipomades University, or just college. And he, they're asking him, does he support, uh, let me see, what does it say? Do you agree to reparation, reparation to the descendants of black Africans enslaved in Brazil? He says, yes. The purpose of financial reparation for the descendants of slaves is current, timely, fair, and would make a correction in the unfair treatment that was forced upon blacks throughout their trajectory in the country. So this is, like I said, among a certain class of people, this is a conversation that's going on. It just hasn't reached the general public as far as I've seen. Now, the other thing I want to point out here, I mentioned the numbers when I started this video, and it says here, you know, 12 million Africans were forcibly embarked brought to the Americas because of and because of the high morbidity, more uh, mortality aboard about 10 million slaves were disembarked in Brazil. Let's see. The, OK, so these are the areas where we're talking about the enslaved Africans landed. Brazil received 45 percent of all of those, you know, Africans that were sent across the Atlantic. The British. OK, so the, the Portuguese brought enslaved Africans to Brazil represents 45 percent of all enslaved Africans sent to the Americas. The British, French, Dutch, and Danish Caribbean is 37%. All of that together is still under the number of how many were brought to Brazil. And all of British, French, Dutch, and Danish Caribbean, 37%. Spanish America received 11%, and North America received 4%, being the United States. Okay. I've always said if we can see this number down here, it breaks it down a little bit more. Mainland North America, 388,000, almost 389,000 enslaved Africans were brought to what would become the United States. Whereas if you look at Brazil, you see the number here is close to 5 million. OK, we look at um, more numbers here from another site. And again, we look at the numbers down here, Spain, Uruguay, a little bit more than a million. Portugal, Brazil, five point. I think that's a five point three million maybe there. Great Britain, 3.2 million. United States, specifically, 305. So we see the disparity, this, you know, the, the difference in the numbers. So according to how the numbers look, it shows like Brazil should be a, a heavyweight in this discussion because they brought in far more enslaved Africans than just the United States did. You know, I'm saying it could be anywhere from 10 to 15 times more, according to these numbers that I'm looking at right now. So. Let's get into the event where this discussion is going on. Um, let me see. There's still more that I still want to review before we move on. One thing I want to point out this. I never got around to doing a video about this. Maybe the time is now to do it. But this news came out last year. You know, um, there was a discussion and there was a demand for an investigation into one of Brazil's biggest bank, one of Brazil's biggest banks, Banco do Brasil, meaning Bank of Brazil, and its, uh, its involvement in the slave trade. So these are all articles that are talking about Banco do Brasil and slavery. Banco do Brasil receives a study that shows support of the bank for slavery in Brazil. What else do we have? Let me see. OK, so this is the, the number that they came up with here. OK, take a look at this. The black movement organization Uniafro is demanding one point four trillion reais from Banco, Banco do Brasil for their supposed participation in the traffic of slaves in the 19th century. They're asking for 1.4 trillion reais. That's a whole lot of money. OK, um, I'm going to do some more research just to see where that discussion is going on, because I never got a chance. To, I never ended up doing a video about that, even though I did some research on it last year. With this ongoing discussion about uh, possible reparations, that's definitely a, a timely video that I want to do you know, sometime in the future. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about this event right now. Um, event in Paris celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Routes of Enslaved Peoples program. 
Historical justice, recognition and reparation at UNESCO Brazilian government speaks of commitment to reparation policies for blacks. Um, this I, this article is taken from a, a number of sources. I definitely want to give credit to, you know, my sources for this article. It comes from the Slave Voyages website, the Digital Encyclopedia of European History, Brazil's gov.br website and the Alma Preta website. Again, the uh, Alma Preta being one of the top black media sources in Brazil. This first part is courtesy of Mariani Barbosa. So it says here, the general coordination of memory and truth of slavery and transatlantic trafficking of enslaved persons represented the Ministry of Human Rights and Citizenship at the 30th anniversary of the Routes of Enslaved Peoples Program organized by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization or UNESCO. Fernanda uh, do Nascimento Tomas, this lady right here in the picture with the glasses on, she's the general coordinator of G of CGMET. She took part in one of the panel discussions at the event, which took Paris took place in Paris, France, where the organization's headquarters are located. In her speech, the manager reaffirm, reaffirmed Brazil's commitment to preserving the memory of slavery and advancing reparations policies for people of African descent. Fernanda also addressed the impact of the Routes of Enslaved Peoples Program on raising awareness about the legacy of slavery in Brazil and around the world. Since its creation in 1994, the UNESCO initiative has played a central role in raising awareness about slavery and its global consequences. According to the coordinator, the program has become a fundamental reference for the development of, of research and public policies on the subject by constantly reminding us that slavery was not just a historic historical tragedy, but a process whose wounds still affect millions of people of African descent, including in Brazil, she noted. The event also marked the launch of UNESCO's Network of Places of History and Memory, which seeks to recognize the effects of post-colonial cognitive dissidents on the Black population and better understand how to heal impacted individuals and communities over generations. The Brazilian government representative also addressed the challenges Brazil faces in implementing reparation policies for the descendants of enslaved peoples and highlighted the importance of CGMET created in 2023 for the promotion of memory recognition and reparation for the black population. For the manager, the country is still experiencing the impacts of having been the last nation to officially abolish slavery in the Americas. The coordination I represent is an unprecedented effort by the Brazilian state to tackle these problems seriously and thoroughly, she said. The reflections of this past, she recalled, can be seen in the records of police violence against young black people, social economic marginalization and structural inequalities in Brazil. We need public policies to tackle these historical uh, inequalities. Reparation is not just about the past. It's a question of social justice for the future, for the present and the future, Tomas added. Um, just a note on that. Um, I haven't done a lot of videos on police violence in Brazil, but it's just even though the United States gets a lot of press about police violence against the black population, Brazil arguably has far more police violence against people of African descent than in the United States. But you really hear about it, you know, by some estimates, depending on how you look at the estimates, Brazilian police can kill between five and 20 times more people of color in Brazil than United States police forces. Uh, and it's, it's just very clear. So when we say to me, I've said this in terms of reparations in the United States, people say slavery happened a long time ago. You know, why should we have to, you know, there's nobody today who's enslaved. I would, I've always said this, even if we don't discuss slavery, let's say we take slavery off the map in terms of the United States. If you just look at the history of Jim Crow, you know, de facto racism, if you just look at redlining, these types of, you know, even though they were not institutionally practiced, these led to vast inequalities between the black and white population in the United States, even if you don't talk about the slave era. If we were to dismiss the slave era in Brazil, you still talk about how black people were scattered and forced to just live on their own accord. They had to live in the favelas. They had a lack of uh access to education equal to the to the white population. We talk about the police violence that takes away thousands of lives of black, black and brown Brazilians every year. So even if we take slavery off the plate, there's still an enormous inequality that has to be rectified. We have to discuss this. It's not saying, OK, y'all just want some free money. It's like, OK, if slavery had not have happened, if de facto racism and racial discrimination had not happened, is there any way we could put a, a financial figure on that? 
because I've seen this, you know, people will say even in poverty where Brazilians live in favelas, where black poverty and white poverty live side by side. But there's studies that show us that even in the favelas and even in poor communities, there's a certain advantage that, you know, white Brazilians have over black Brazilians. So the question is, can we quantify that even if we take slavery off the, you know, off the dot? That's what I'm that's the question that I would ask. Uh, Let me see here. Fighting for historical justice, recognition and reparation. These are the three axes uh, established by Fernando Tomas, a professor and researcher of African history at the head of the General Coordination of Memory and Truth of Slavery and Transatlantic Trafficking of Enslaved Persons. In her view, the unprecedented creation of a coordination specifically focused on the memory of slavery, represents a major step towards repairing the traces that three centuries of exploitation have left in Brazil, said the professor. These are some of the routes coming from, you know, mostly the West Coast of Africa here, but then also from over here, like over in Mozambique, you had, these are the slave routes that the Portuguese led to bring in uh, Africans into the land that would be called Brazil. In this sense, the historian reflects that for many years, the history of slavery was told from the perspective of the oppressors who praise their own history. However, this narrative oppresses descendants of enslaved people and the ancestry of the Brazilian people who have been victims of racism, discrimination and violence for centuries. Scars that are still open. For Fernanda Tomas, there is a necessity to listen to and value these voices. Historical injustice is directly linked to recognition because recognizing it is a way of confronting and deconstructing the uh, erasure of this violent heritage. She says in a video published on her YouTube channel. Um, what else I wanted to say? Let me see. Um, historical justice. The one thing, other thing I wanted to point out is that even though slavery ended in Brazil in 1888, we're talking about, what is that, about 136 years ago? The presence in the psyche of a lot of Brazilians, it still sits there in the jokes that people do associating uh, people of African descent with slavery. You know, people will just readily say, hey, go back to the Senzala, Volta para Senzala. You know, it's telling people to go back to the slave quarters. You see jokes with people like, you know, who let this slave loose? You know, come and pick up your slave. You know, you know, numerous articles that I've done in the past that show that even in the 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 current consciousness of the population history, history connected to slavery is still like a joke and it's still present in the psyche of the nation. We see this all the time. Slavery. Let me see. Um, Slavery was fundamentally one of the greatest human rights violations recorded in history. That's why Fernanda highlights the importance of memory and understanding the scars that thousands of people still bear. Memory is a space of dispute. In our historical process, the memory that has had the most visibility has been the memory produced by a specific and privileged group, which has been controlling power, including these social relations, she points out. In this dispute, recognizing the importance of Black people as references and valuing their uh, ancestral roots emerges as an urgent contemporary task. Recognizing and valuing these roots is a way of boosting the self-esteem and identity of Black people and combating the denial and historical invisibility that permeates society. One form of valorization is the presence of Black references in academic life, a factor that is directly related to memory and reparation to the manager's history. Fernanda Tomas was the first in her family to go to the university and recognizes the challenges as a black woman. We know that the black population is most affected by legacies of, <clears throat> legacies of slavery. For years, I was the only black student in the classroom. I didn't even have any black teachers, she recalls. I remember some years ago, there was a, an online movement where black Brazilians were ask, asking people, have you ever had a black college professor? You know, how many teachers did you have, you know, in your primary education, in your high school years? You know, the number of black professors in Brazilian universities is minuscule compared to the overall uh, population of people who are, you know, college and university professors. So have you ever had a black college professor? That's a question that people were asking some years ago. The teacher says that her greatest motivation to delve into Black history was her grandmother, Conceição, who was born 31 years after the abolition of slavery. Uh, but understood her place in history as Julio Vargas's laundress. Okay, Julio Vargas is one of the most uh, well-known uh, presidents in Brazil's history. I'm trying to remember when he was president. I think we're going back to the 30s and 40s, maybe. I think he he was a president once or twice. He left office and he actually came back for another term. Don't remember exactly what years, but we're talking about you know, like the World War II years in Brazil, sometime between the 
early to mid thirties, maybe through the forties and fifties. I, I, I don't remember how many terms Jadulio Vargas served, but he's a well-known figure in Brazilian history. So she's saying that, uh, her, her grandmother was, I guess she was the, you know, the laundry washer for Getulio Vargas. That's what I get from that. Um, there's pictures of Getulio Vargas with, you know, I think uh, with uh, FDR from the 1940s, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff named after Getulio Vargas in, in Brazil. He's just an important historical figure in terms of uh, leaders in Brazil's government. That was her way of inserting herself into Brazil's official history, saying that she was present. She didn't understand that probably just a few years earlier, her grandparents had been enslaved and their stories wouldn't be officially told. We need to fight against this erasure of memory, she explains. This is a picture of uh, enslaved Brazilians. Um, there was a bunch of uh, pictures taken from Brazil's slave era that popped up some years ago. These all these black and white pictures of, you know, black black people toiling away like in you know uh the, the, the sugar fields you know they a lot of these pictures are taken from like the state of sao paulo you've got some from rio and you know just the national archive have released some of these pictures um this is called escravidão nunca mais like slavery never more never again Slavery left a deep legacy of inequality and discrimination that persists to this day. Maintaining the memory of slavery and rewriting the course of history are important and ongoing challenges for society as a whole. The work of this coordination will rely on social participation. At first, we are going to listen in order to make a diagno diagnosis relying on different experiences, says Fernanda. Fernanda Tomas also adds that based on this initial process, state policies will be made possible that uh, maintain independent of the current government. We have four years ahead of us and we won't be able to do everything. After all, there are centuries of urgency, but we will lay a foundation to really change people's lives, a path to rewrite history, she concluded. OK, so the ongoing discussion about reparations in Brazil. Um, let me see if I can find some of those pictures. As I said, some years ago, there were a number like right here uh, from the in Institute, the Moreira, Moreira Salis Institute. Between 16th and 19th century, an estimated four to five million enslaved Africans were brought to Brazil. These are some of those pictures. Prohibition in the slave trade did not prevent more than 700,000 slaves uh, being brought to Brazil illegally to Brazil between 1831 and 1850. You know, the trade of slaves was supposed to have been and had ended by that time. These are some more pictures. Brazilian slaves were not compensated uh, with the signing of the Golden Law. This is yet another picture from the Moreira Salles Institute. Um, there's some really, really revealing pictures that came out uh, from some of those, you know, from this uh, this archive of enslaved Brazilians. Right. So is there anything I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover here? The routes of enslaved peoples. Do we have anything else here? This this article is actually talking about something that I've talked about, you know, frequently on the blog and the YouTube channel. The, the existence of people working in situations analogous to slavery in the modern day. Every year, thousands of Brazilians are being released from, you know, situations in, in which they're working as slaves. You know, that that's huge in a country like Brazil that has such a deep history, in, you know, of enslaving people. And so I'm saying in 2024, you're still finding people working in situations that are close to slavery. What's up with that? So anyway, the discussion about reparations in Brazil. What did you all think about today's video? It's an ongoing discussion. Uh if it was to come to a financial payout or something, this could be enormous. <laughs> In reality, I think this would sink the country if they were really to think about paying out reparations for 350 plus years in slavery. Another issue is, as I said, who qualifies for slavery when you have so many people who can show that they have African ancestry, maybe, you know, up to 100 years ago or so. But if, if a person looks white today, should they should they qualify for having reparations if there is a financial reparation? That's just one of the many questions that will come up as this discussion, you know, continues to proceed. Anyway, reparations in Brazil. What do you think about this discussion? You know, what, do you, what is your position on reparations in the United States? You know, there, there should be a reparations discussion going on throughout the Americas. And there actually are if you look it up. So anyway, um. Let's get a conversation started about this. Drop a comment in the comment section, like this video, share this video, consider subscribing to the channel and click on the notification bell so that you know when I upload a new video. With that said, I'm going to end this video here. Request that you all come back. Check out the next video that I post here at Black Brazil Today.